Well, aloha, everyone, and welcome back to People and Nature here at Chaminade University. Today we'll be starting Unit 6, where we will be talking about biodiversity and species loss. We'll be discussing threats to biodiversity and the fact that species loss is incessant, and so we have to address the ability to keep their habitat safe so that they are able to recover, particularly species that are on the endangered list. So I'd like to jump right in talking about extinction. If a population count of a species falls so low that there are no reported specimens in existence, and I believe there's a certain time frame, it's usually five years that they've found no specimens, it's considered to have died out or have gone extinct. And species that are in danger of extinction are considered endangered. These species are very low in population and are facing habitat loss and are likely to face extinction themselves if we have no intervention. So these are the exact definitions. Extinct means that there's no reasonable doubt that the last individual has died. Determined after exhaustive surveys of animals known range and expected habitat. So in order for an animal to be considered extinct, it has to have demonstrated that that animal existed in the first place, which lots of animals that are entering into habitat loss or having endangered, um, just being endangered in general, often aren't even discovered yet because we are ravaging our environment faster than we're able to keep up science-wise. Um, we also have endangered species, which are species that are very unlikely to survive if our operations continue as normal basically. They have a reduced population, drastically reduced habitat. These guys are critically endangered. Um, critically endangered means that they're considered to be facing an extremely high risk of extinction in the wild. That means that they are right on the cusp of becoming extinct. Vulnerable populations are near in danger. They are right on the, they're bordering basically. And if causal factors continue, they may end up nearing endangerment. However, if intervention occurs, their numbers could re rebound. Their numbers are currently abundant and stable, but are under threat from multiple aspects. Generally, these factors include things like over like over exploitation of, say, it's a resource, a food resource, or, um, or habitat destruction, so it, something that is going to endanger their ability to find food or shelter or water. Organisms that are considered near-threatened are populations that are small populations that are at risk but are currently doing okay. However, a small unexpected threat could easily cause a critical decline. So these populations are doing well for now but have to be left alone geographic disturbance-wise. So we're not able to go through and put a shopping mall, for example, in one of their habitats. Um, and then we have two which are going to be areas that generally aren't going to concern us. One of the ones that are of least concern, these are species that are in high abundance. Um, but lastly, we also have species that are unknown. And unfortunately, a high percentage of our species actually fall into this category. And that means that we just don't have enough information on their species population levels, et cetera, on their habitat, on their food source. So something is missing from the literature that, it allow, that d disallows us to be able to put them in any of the above categories. So I like to play a little game here just to kind of install on you that extinction, I extinction is forever. So how many endangered species are you able to name? And I've enlisted the help of the World Wildlife Federation um, to go through some of these. So here's the Amur leopard, the black rhino, the Bornean orangutan, the cross river gorilla, the saula, the Sunda tiger, the finless porpoise, the African wild dog, the Asian elephant, the bonobo, the Galapagos penguin, the green turtle, the red panda, the mountain gorilla, the sea turtle, the whale shark, and many, many, many more. And I just took a selected few sets of photographs from the World Wildlife Foundation, but there's plenty more on there. If you want to do some further research, you can click on the link at the bottom. And they also have a list of the species that are considered to be vulnerable. That means they're at risk for endangerment. And I'm not going to go through all of them, obviously. I'm just going to give you a couple more. But that includes things like the giant tortoise, the giant panda, the hippopotamus, the polar bear, the marine iguana, the jaguar, these are all species that we are able to save if we are able to take preventative measures. And in order to do that, we need definite data. So how do we measure population sizes, things like species count, habitat loss, so that we can create these lists that enable us to protect species by saying these are endangered or they are vulnerable populations. 
And unfortunately, our estimates are kind of all over the map. Um, they vary considerably based on different mathematical models presented, and the mathematical models generally have differences in how they are run and face issues like not having enough baseline data to begin with. So we're starting, we're extrapolating from data that isn't really solid, perhaps. And then, of course, lack of funding to be able to perform this research, which has always been um, a battle. So unfortunately, that lack of funding for research results in many habitats and many groups being underreported in terms of their, um, the threats on their habitats or even on their existence. And the rates of species loss is not stopping simply because we don't know how many species there are or which species are where. In fact, the current rate of species loss gra drastically has increased as compared to the past due to human influence. So we are directly responsible for species extinction using this, several of the different methods, including habitat destruction and introduction of invasive species, whether it was intentional or accidental. And so there was an international union of conservation of nature put together in order to be able to categorize these populations and species based on whether or not they are extinct, endangered, critically endangered, vulnerable, or unknown. So how do they make the red list of species? So they look at many different factors to determine whether or not they should put this species on different lists, and that's going to include the population size, the degree of the specialization, the distribution, the reproductive potential and behavior, the geographic range, and fragmentation of the species and populations, the quality of their habitat, the trophic level, and last but not least, obviously the most importantly, the probability of extinction. Now as we mentioned last units. Tropical biomes are regions that have high global biodiversity, and biodiversity is very important. We talked about that in terms of medicine and bio, um, being able to take pharmaceuticals from these plants and animals. But the idea that they are unsustainable in terms of, uh, are, are sustainable in terms of their population and therefore can be exploited unsustainably means that they are actually subjected to severe losses in biodiversity and that results in their inability to perform ecological services for the community. Things like being able to give back to their habitat, for example, or um, perform essential functions. And we talked about ecological services last chapter. Um, but one of the other big problems that happens in tropical biomes is that generally they happen to occur in poorer countries, right? And we have, if we have less economic development, generally they're open to exploitation and it's very difficult to get sustainable conservation efforts or development efforts in there that are going to help work with the populations and even do the surveys that need to be done before they go through and decimate the environment. So tropical biomes are at the highest risk areas, which is unfortunate because they actually have the highest biodiversity as well. Um, so the current estimates of the number of species on Earth currently ranges from 5 to 30 million, which is a, quite a broad um, range, and of that only 1.8 million has been formally described. That means that we're looking at at least threefold, but perhaps um, 10 to 20 fold, the amount of species in existence than we actually know of and have put in the literature. And if we have only identified a small percentage of species, for example, for vertebrates, we think we've found most of them. We have 46,000 that we've identified. We think there's probably 5,000 out there that we're missing. That's actually relatively good. And compared to looking at, for example, algae, where we know that we have about 15,000 on record, but there's an estimated to be about 500,000, that leaves us short by about 485,000, or about 97%, that we truly just don't know. So how can we even be sure of what we are losing? And this is a real problem because our lack of knowledge means it's really hard to estimate extinction rates. If we never knew that species even existed, how do we know that it's gone? But of the species that we do know exist, we know that we're losing 100 species per million species every single year. And we think that it's much higher than that. We think it's about a thousand times the background rate, right, the, the amount that um, we actually know of. And that equates to about three species per hour, and we know for certain that humans are responsible. I'm going to say that again. Humans are responsible. Yes, a very small percentage of species would be facing extinction due to just inability to compete their, or inability to find resources. But the current rate of species loss is so much greater now than it ever was in the past because humans are 
engaging in activities that cause extinction, things like habitat destruction or invasive species introduction, pollution, over-harvesting, and hunting of these species. Over the past 500 years, we know that we've lost at least 1,000 species, right? Um, and the current amphibian range, we extinction rate is actually much higher. We think we have about 25,000 to 45,000. Um, and that means that over 50% of the world's primate species and in addition to this, I apologize, over 50% of the primate species of the planet are at risk of extinction. And this is just showing the cumulative extinction events over time for each of the different general classes of animals. And the current extinction rate is about 100 species per million species per year. So that's so much more, right? That's about 10 years worth. This is five, over the past 500 years. So that's so much more than it used to be directly because of human activities. So, of the human, of the extinction events that we know of since 1600, the causal events have been mainly human. Approximately 98% of them, hunting, introduction of foreign species, habitat destruction, etc. Approximately 2% have been of what we consider to be natural causes. So, over the past 500 years, we've drastically increased these human activities that are leading to massive extinction events on the planet. So let's talk about some of the things that I want to talk about today, right? We aren't exactly able to quantify the biodiversity on the planet, but we do know that it's decreasing rapidly and that humans are responsible. And we need to use species conservation bio biology to be able to look at how we can investigate the conservation of biodiversity, and that's going to be very important. So the big questions we're going to have to address here um, are what kind of solutions are out there? And how have the solutions emerging been directed at preventing environmental impact versus limiting the extent of current environmental impacts or restoration of systems where environmental impacts have already occurred? So habitat restoration in areas that have already been deforested, for example. And so how are we going to address these issues in terms of sustainability or sustainable development, particularly in third world countries when they face much bigger problems on their own plate, but on a global scale, the biggest problem is extinction and loss of biodiversity. So what kind of predictions can we take from this, right? Where are we going to be just a couple decades away, right? What's, what is the state of human society and the biosphere going to be just a couple decades away if we maintain our current extinctive rate? And how can we determine if populations are actually a, at a threat for extinction, right? How do we know that we can make them, we'll put them on the endangered list versus being able to restore those populations? What are our methods of being able to restore balance and restore habitat so that these species actually are going to be able to get off of the endangered species list eventually, right? That's the objective is to put them on the vulnerable and then have them end up at the point where their populations are restored to normal. So eventually the goal is to balance these tropical biome regions in terms of biodiversity, but also allow the populations to have development efforts so they can have some economic prosperity, right? So you want to balance development and conservation efforts in these regions that have such high biodiversity. What are the major threats that these biomes face? And how are we, can we try to intervene and, and limit the extent of these environmental impacts? And what happens when these impacts are going to be kind of at odds with economic development, right? Because it's always about the bottom dollar for the humans, but that's going to lead to our global demise. So what kind of conflicts do we have between things like exploration, sustainable development, and conservation, and economic development, etc., in these tropical biome regions? All right, so first and foremost, let's talk about how we maintain biodiversity. The first maintenance of biodiversity is to have a complex ecosystem. We have to have multiple different tiers, or what we call trophic levels. We have to have different successors, so different stages of succession. First we have, um, for example, you need to have plants in order to have the animals, right? So you have stages of succession of animals that are, or creatures that are going to invade these particular regions after, for example, deforestation. Um, so there's a lot of different factors that help maintain biodiversity, but when we're looking at species loss, we have two major causes. Natural causes, which as I showed you earlier, were a very small percentage. 
Things like the mass extinction event that killed the dinosaurs over here depicted by the meteor impacting the earth. That's obviously not a photograph, that's a depiction. Um, but then also we have human causes, and this is a very unfortunate photograph of a rhino that has had his horn removed, and it's very unlikely to survive without human intervention. Now, hopefully this guy did stand a chance since he is still alive and was being able to be saved by someone who could take him to an animal hospital, but without his horn, there's a high chance of there being an infection that's going to lead into the brain. So this is the animal that's going to end up being lost simply so that they can get a very small percentage for voodoo, realistically, um, a unbacked scientific theory that you can increase male virility by taking a rhino's horn and grinding it up and consuming it. So um, this is one example that's poaching, but there's several other examples of human causes that can cause species loss. So the natural causes of species loss are generally pretty catastrophic events, things like volcanic eruptions or meteors hitting the earth, massive droughts, plagues, ice ages, um, but also it can be a little bit more subtle, things like competition for food resources and habitat or predator-prey relationships that kind of go awry and out of balance, right? If we end up with way more predators than prey, it's very easy for the prey to end up going extinct. Sometimes that's followed immediately by the predators, right, if you lose your food source. But we have a ton of human causes as well. And the human causes make this little anagram and hippo. So that'll help you if you want to kind of remember if you end up running this questions on the quiz. But and hippo stands for agriculture practices, natural hazards and disaster, disasters that humans have exacerbated, things like dams breaking, etc. Um, disease spread, habitat destruction and fragmentation. So not just maybe destroying the habitat, but interrupting it by a highway so that the species on the left and the species on the right that were once one species are no longer able to interbreed and may end up undergoing speciation, speciation or one side might end up dying off because it has no food source or something like that. Um, introduced species, which are going to be a non-native species that outcompetes the native species for whatever reason, maybe a food source or it's better water or just as, as a plant it overgrows and, and gets rid of all of the sunshine. Um, pollution is a really big problem from human populations. Um, human population growth also, at, which leads to O, oh, which is the over-exploitation, right? The more humans in an area, the more resources they need, the more they destroy their natural environment to get those resources. So agriculture is one of the biggest reasons for loss of biodiversity. So agriculture is a monoculture generally. That means it's all the same plant for miles and miles. Um, and that means that we have the ability to end up with genetic um, predispositions to certain plagues, etc. But also it means that we're spraying a lot of pesticides because we only want, or herbicides, because we want to have no pests and we only want to have that specific species that we want to grow, right? Um, and so agriculture introduces a lot of toxins to the land and also removes habitat that used to be biodiverse and reduces it down to monodiversity, right? Which means you only have one organism on a much larger scale. Additionally, humans can induce things like natural hazards and disasters simply by, well, not all of these, right? They don't induce hearth earthquakes or hurricanes, but the increase of natural disasters is associated with global climate change, which is something that humans have had influence on. Some examples of natural ha hazards and disasters are things like hurricanes um, or earthquakes or volcanic eruptions, and these can have a negative impact on the environment that then can lead to species loss events. Additionally, we can have the spread of diseases. Um, diseases can reduce the numbers of a population, which can decrease by diversity, meaning that we can have extinctive events, or we can just reduce the numbers of a population, so we reduce the genetic variability within that population. And usually diseases are species-specific, but sometimes they can travel across the species barrier, and we're actually dealing with the severe consequences of this right now. That's actually why I'm talking to you from behind a computer instead of in front of a, the screen, um, is something called a coronavirus. So this here is a coronavirus, coronavirus 19, or COVID as we know it. Um, and this is what is causing a pandemic around the world right now. And that has actually been a virus that has transferred from a non-human population to a human population. They actually think it came from pangolins, which are a very super cute organism that I haven't shown here, but feel free to look it up if you get the chance. Pangolins. But it came out of what we call a wet market in Japan. I'm sorry, in China. I apologize. Um, and the wet market in China basically was selling a lot of different animals. And because we had a lot of animals in small spaces that weren't really subjected to the same kind of rules and regulations that we were subjected to in other first world countries, um, diseases were able to be spread. And because the disease was able to spread from one organism to another organism entirely it was able to infect a human and from there we are where we are today um, so disease spread is going to be one of the main reasons for decreasing biodiversity and 
increasing and decreasing um, the amount of species in an area because we can wipe out an entire species in one go if we aren't careful. All right, this is just another picture of the coronavirus, just for those of you that are interested. This is the cell that's been infected by the coronavirus. These are little coronavirus particles. And if you zoom in a little closer, this is a rupturing cell. These are all little coronavirus particles that are all being shed by a cell that has been infected. So anyway, we're going to move on because that isn't the topic of discussion for today. Um, so another way that humans are impacting the biodiversity and increasing the loss of species include habitat loss and fragmentation, which I just discussed. So habitat loss would be the complete destruction of the habitat in that area and fragmentation would be something like a highway running through it or something like that that's going to separate out populations from one side to another but both of them are going to reduce the quality of habitat that's available for organisms to live in. Things like logging for example, um, deforestation, uh, agriculture so we're going to clear cut the entire forest so that we can then um, put in a monoculture of corn something like that. Uh, but we can also have entire loss of an entire region and that could be an example like uh, paving an area so that we could build a, a shopping mall um, or convert an entire region to farmlands or residential subdivisions which now are just covered in concrete and or small little gardens and grass and no longer have habitat for the species that used to live in that forest. Um, and fragmentation is when we take a much larger area and we divide it up into smaller areas. This is an example of fragmentation. So species that used to be able to free roam now can live here or here, but are in danger if they are here, right? They might be in danger of being shot or being run over by, say that's a cars, it's a highway, something like that. Um, so fragmentation can result in species loss because they're no longer able to interbreed, they're no longer able to get from one spot to another. And so if there's a small population in this area, and this is a highway, and this is a highway, eventually this population will fall into decline and end up with no population at all while we'll still maintain a population here or here, for example. Um, and so fragments are these small little islands where populations can thrive, but only if they're able to survive in that area. And they have a much smaller population size, obviously, and they're not able to interbreed with the other populations. That also allows to, that makes them vulnerable to things like diseases and inbreeding, right? Inbreeding makes populations vulnerable to diseases. And diseases are able to be passed back and forth between domestic and wild spaces, right? If this is human habitat and this is wild habitat, all of a sudden um, organisms that might have been sick here can then pass that off if we have species to species transmission to, to humans. Alright, we can also introduce alien species, and no, it doesn't look like this, although I just found this comical, but alien species are non-native species, organisms that live somewhere else originally, and then are brought to that environment, and sometimes it works just fine, things like potatoes, potatoes are actually one of the major staples that were brought from America to Europe, and they uh, they were just fine, they don't outcompete their natural competitors, the natural environment, they can thrive without causing major decimation, right? But sometimes it's a complete disaster. Sometimes an invasive species comes in and completely wipes out all the native plants um, or causes toxicity to local animals, etc. Um, and we here are dealing with invasive species as well. Here in Hawaii, you might have heard of the Kokui frog, which goes Kokui, Kokui, and is declining property values on the big island and here at Oahu as well in certain places because apparently it's a little bit of a noise at night that bothers the homeowners. But they're actually out competing the native frog populations and they breed so quickly that they are taking over. So we ha are also dealing with invasive species issues. And that's just one example, but there are plenty more, which when we get the chance to go to the Kaneohe Marine Corps, um, sorry, Kaneohe Marine Base reserve, we'll be able to talk more about the research that's happening there on some native species that are threatened by invasive species. But I digress. Some other things that threaten species and uh, populations include pollution, and humans are one of the major polluters of the environment, right? Local pollution, things like oil spills, for example, that might kill the seabirds, but also things like environmental pollution, like factory emission, uh, smog, etc., or fertilizer, so agriculture pollution, fertilizer that runs off into the waterway and then makes it into the ocean, etc. Um, and then also, impact of what we release, our global emissions, which release into our environment, which causes climate change. We'll talk about global warming. Um, in a different lecture, but climate change is real and it changes the weather patterns and shifts things such that um, the habitats change and that shifts the biomes, right? And that means that organisms that were living in that area where the habitats are now changing are no longer able to, perhaps no longer able to adapt. Um, and so humans and pollution are one of the major reasons why we have species loss and loss of biodiversity. And humans are growing at an at exponential rates, right? The world population is not, has 
reached um, 7 billion people, right? We reached it in 2000, actually. I think that was 20 years ago. We're much higher now. I think we're at 9 billion now, as I recall. And so my point is that humans aren't slowing down in terms of their population growth. So we have to learn to live with these populations and to protect these regions or we're going to end up in trouble in a very short while, right? We can't overexploit our resources. We are really good at catching, hunting, and harvesting other populations. We have technology that allows us to harvest them in large amounts, right? We can use chainsaws instead of having to use our arms axes. And now we don't even use chainsaws. We use these giant machines that can go through and run the saws for us. So we don't even have to hold the chainsaws anymore. We can use tricks to be able to hunt fish like sonar and trolley nets. And we talked about that when we talked about fishery populations, when we talked about aquatic diversity. But my point is that we no longer play fair, right? We can exploit resources to the point where we have nothing left, and that's called the tragedy of the commons. Basically what that means is that when individuals are doing what's best for them, right, they're feeding themselves and their family, or they are taking a bunch of fish out of the, out of the ocean so they can sell it at market to be able to be economically prosperous, that's always been considered a good thing, because in, but individually, while it's good, overall it's bad because it leads to exploitation and loss of all the resources. The tragedy of the commons is basically when everyone does what's best for themselves, it becomes what's worst for the whole. Um, and so in order to prevent the tragedy of the commons, we wanted to try to make a list of threatened species. And a union called the International Union of conservation of nature was established and it creates these threatened species and we have those several categories that I talked about that includes endangered, um, extinct obviously, endangered, critically endangered, vulnerable, and um, and unknown. And there's a lot of things that we take a look at, including population size, degree of specialization, etc. And if we have lack of information on any of these, then sometimes we end up not being able to afford the protection to a species that needs it simply because we don't have enough information. All right, so the IUCN, again, makes this red list, and the goals of that to be, were to be able to provide a systematic analysis that could be applied consistently across species to evaluate the risk of extinction events. And again, these criteria include population size. The smaller the population size, the more likely they're going to be susceptible to extinctive events. Um, the degree of specialization, the more vulnerable they are, are because they're more specialized because they are only able to consume a certain food source for example when they need a particular niche so if they live in a spe specialized habitat with a limited range of resources they're not going to be able to just up and move to a different habitat additionally their geographic range and how fragmented it is so how intact the habitat is and how large a geographic area the larger they are the more intact they are the less likely they are to be affected but the less intact and the smaller they are, the more likely they are to be affected because small changes can impact them much more greatly than other organisms. Um, trophic level, right? Are they apex predators? Apex predators are um, much likely, much less likely to survive the, um, the major disturbance because they, serve, they rely on the food source. And so if something ends up being lost in a lower trophic level, they are also subjected to that. The distribution of the population, so if it's just distributed over a much larger area or if there's a lot of different populations of that species, they're much more likely to survive if one gets wiped out, for example. Habitat quality, right? If they're already kind of running low on nutrients and energy pathways, then a very small disruption to in that pathway can make them more vulnerable, but if they have a lot of options for different nutrient sources, then if you lose one food source, you have other options. All of these factors can be combined to make some species more vulnerable to extinction than others. And that also can come from their reproductive behavior, right? If they have more um, if they have more offspring, more often, they have a higher reproductive rate. That means they have more offspring. That means they have a higher percentage chance of those offspring surviving than organisms that perhaps wait much longer for sexual maturity and have much lower um, numbers of offspring. So let's talk about these these parameters. For example, having a ne narrow geographic range. An example of that is the golden lion tamarind, right? It only lives right here. So if this habitat is destroyed, that's it. There's nowhere else for this guy to go, right? A small population size, like the snow leopard, right? Small population sizes generally have very low genetic diversity, so they're susceptible to population, um, <clears throat> to diseases, for example, or they're going to inbreeding, so they end up with perhaps a crooked tail you've heard of in certain jaguar populations. So they end up with a less genetic diversity, means they are way less resilient to change if something in their environment gives them some sort of selective pressure. 
if they have a low population density but a large territory, that means that while they're surviving just fine, they, this guy right here, he's loving his bamboo, he's, he's surviving just fine, but reproduction is also important in terms of survival of the fittest, right? Survival to reproduce. And so if they're unable to meet a mate, then they're unlikely to be able to make babies. And so that means that we have a much, very large area with very few organisms, but those organisms can't interact with each other very often. For example, a giant panda has a very large range per, per individual of approximately five square kilometers. So the chances of this giant panda interacting with another giant panda of the opposite sex and breeding potential is slim. Other barriers include small populations or very few populations. If there's only one population, then if that population gets wiped out, if that habitat gets wiped out, for example, that's their only chance of survival. The whole species will be lost. Specialty um, organisms like lemurs that are only found in Madagascar, which is an island found off the coast of Africa, now, there's only one or two groups of each of the species. And so if that group's gone, the species is gone. There aren't a lot of subgroups for the species to be able to migrate with. It also leads to genetic, um, in low genetic variability because they're inbreeding with their same population without being able to find another group of the species to share genes with, to have genetic flow, basically. <clears throat> so a 10% rule, that means that 10% of the prey, I'm sorry, there should be 10 times as many prey to be able to sustain a predator. And that means that we have way fewer predators than we do prey populations. And prey populations are going to be what feeds the predator. So that means that predators need to be sustained by the population of the prey, right? Um, also, another problem with large predators is that oftentimes large predators are a danger to humans. And so in indigenous societies, they end up being hunted or be considered trophies, right? Oh, I, I'm so strong, so look at this tiger's pelt that I brought home. Right? Additionally, if they're competing with humans for food resources, it might be another reason why a local population might hunt this animal to extinction. Another reason an organism might be in danger would be low reproductive potential. As I mentioned, it's not just about survival, it's about surviving to reproduce. And just like the panda, which had a hard time finding a mate, if you had take a long while to reach sexual maturity, that means that you have a long while that you could die prior to being able to reproduce. An example of that are the albatrosses. They only produce one egg per year, and it takes several years for them to become sexually mature. So they have a, a low um, reproduction rate in order to be able to be a, make the next generation. I apologize for my stuttering there. Um, another barrier might be a seasonal migration, something like the salmon, where they have to undergo a hazardous dirt journey to be able to spawn. And they also have to travel through multiple habitats. So one dam in between habitat A and habitat B can disrupt the entire population from being able to breed, which means that these populations are very susceptible to changes to those habitats. Sometimes species have a very difficult time moving from one habitat to another. Some examples of that are non-flying animals like the cassowary um, or flightless birds that are in threatened habitats, right, like the cassowary. Also plants that might rely on seed dispersal by an animal that is facing an extinction, right, an endangered animal. So there's less and less of that animal, so that plant's unable to have its seed dispersed. So while we might have a lot of that plant in a certain region, it's not going to be able to move to a new habitat very easily. And so poor dispersers uh, are going to be much more subjectable to habitat loss than organisms that are able to migrate to another environment easily. If animals have a high degree of specialization, like the koala bear, they only have one food source. They only eat eucalyptus. If there's no eucalyptus, they'll just sit there and starve. And if a single food source can be easily destroyed, that makes that animal vulnerable to in becoming endangered or extinct. So we use a lot of different um, parameters to put these organisms into several categories, right? Um, and collapse, these are going to be organisms that are extinct. Right? They're already past the point of return. Um, they might not have been entirely extinct, but it might be the very last Galapagos tortoise, for example. So Lonely George, there is no female. This will not continue, right? Once Lonely George passes, he may already have. I haven't checked in a while. That population will be considered extinct. So that would be considered collapsed. Critically endangered means that the chances of their being able to restore outside in the wild are very, very slim, and they are probably only ever going to be able to 
reproduce in zoos or in, in care of human habitats. Endangered animals are animals that do have wild populations, but again, they are going to be at critical risk of extinction very easily, so habitat loss can throw them over the edge very easily. Vulnerable, they're teetering, the populations are stable, um, but again, they could always become endangered very easily if they were to have some sort of um, event occur. Near threatened and least concerned organisms are not going to make the population, and they're not going to be ones that we could really worry about. Most of the ones that are going to end up on, on their list though are going to be data deficient. We don't have all of the information to be able to make these judgment calls on a lot of organisms. Additionally, some organisms are not evaluated. Deep sea organisms, we have very, very little information on the organisms at the bottom of the ocean. So we have no idea if they're under threat. So not evaluated. Okay, And this is the same thing that I just told you, just in a, a different format. So now I'm going to go back over what I told you to begin with. Now you have an idea of how, what the threats are. So extinct population means that we know the last individual is dead, right? Or a collapsed population would indicate that we are not able to reproduce anymore. All of the last living organisms are past reproductive age or the same sex or whatnot. Endangered means that survival is unlikely as it stands. Without intervention, like being able to have them reproduce in zoos, etc. These organisms are very unlikely to survive. They have reduced populations, reduced habitat, etc. Um, critically endangered, again, these guys are going to be very close to extinction. These are the most endangered that have a very high risk of extinction in the wild and are probably going to be animals that are only going to be seen in zoos from that point forward. Um, vulnerable populations, again, these are teetering and their numbers are abundant, but there's a lot of factors that could affect their population, things like exploitation and habitat destruction that they are facing um, or are coming up upon things like or areas that are the main habitat that are bordering on areas that have already been deforested for example and again near threatened and least concern are organisms that are probably going to do just fine without our intervention and this is a just a collage of a lot of different organisms that have made it on the endangered or vulnerable species list. So this is important. This is when I hit you in the heartstrings and tell you that these animals deserve our help, guys. And really they do. More than that, they need it. And we need them too because they're part of our environment. And without all of the different organisms inside the environment, we don't have an ecosystem. And without an ecosystem, we don't have ecosystem function. And so we really need to rely on all of these other organisms for our own habitat as well. All right, so what do we do about this, right? How do we attack this? We, we need to be able to get a way to affect the tropical biomes. Okay, so these are regions that are going to have the most biodiverse areas, and they've been unsustainably exploited. That means that they probably have low economic um, income, and they are going to have resources that have been harvested, and that's going to result in losses of biodiversity. Oftentimes, these regions aren't even well documented, so you don't even know what you're losing. And when we lose these organisms, we lose the ability of these biomes to perform globally important ecological services, right? Coral reefs don't just provide the, uh, for their local environments, right? They provide the baby fish. The baby fish travel all over the larger organisms. They provide for the entire ocean, and then the oceans provide for the humans on land by the fishing. So um, these are areas that are going to be very important, not just for their local environment, but also for the entire globe. Tropical biomes have over 50% of the species on the planet, and often they have specialized niches. What that means is that they are only found in a specific region of a specific habitat, or they only are able to eat a specific food source within that specific habitat. Um, and humans disrupt that environment for a lot of reasons, but mainly for logging and deforestation for agriculture. And if you change just one part of an ecosystem, people think of it like a food chain, but it's more of a food web, right? And so if you change one part of the web, the whole thing kind of breaks down like a run in a lady's stocking. It's going to alter the entire web of relationships, and it's a cascade that's very difficult to put back into place. Um, and if we lose the rainforest, we're going to lead to extinction of approximately 10% of the world's species over the next 25 years. Guys, that's no joke. That's a whole lot of species, and we're going to end up suffering ourselves from this. And regeneration rate is really difficult in areas like the biomes is, because oftentimes they have poor soil quality. Usually what happens in these areas, because they have their tropical rainforest, right? They have degradation very quickly. The organisms that are alive right now depend on the organisms that are freshly dead. And so if we end up removing the organisms from like the biomass when we deforest something, it's really impossible to get those nutrients back into the soil because we have rapid re 
rapid nutrient cycling throughout the throughout the year. And so if we don't restore those nutrients for the next round of plants, that soil is actually going to be depleted of the nutrients that we need. So how do we do this, right? We need international legislation. Because these LEDC countries, right, the low economic countries, these guys are not going to be the ones that are going to step up and help preserve the planet, right? So we need international legislation that can step forward and say, I know that this is your country, but preserving this region is important to the entire globe. And the willingness to participate in these conservation efforts varies from country to country. It's dependent on a lot of things. Economics, right? If they have, they're worried about feeding their families, they're way less likely to worry about the environment. Social and political views. Um, what uh, What's going on in terms of war, right? Or diseases, right? Now the pandemic is taking the forefront in every direction. But most of the biomes are located in these regions that are low economic regions. And there's often conflicts in low economic regions between the resource exploration and resource explo exploitation, really, um, and sustainability. So this is going to be very important, and it's underscored here. So these are a lot of the regions where we have tropical biome regions shown in green. And you can see these regions that are less economically developed countries generally. And so usually we have exploitation occurring. That's kind of at odds with trying to have sustainable development or conservation efforts occurring. Right? And this is very, actually very sad globally. One hectare of rainforest or 2.4 acres of rainforest are destroyed every second. If you put that in context, that's two U.S. football fields every second. Right? And that means that every minute, 120 football fields or 149 acres or 60 hectares, all of those are the same units. Um, are being destroyed every single minute. So time is really just slipping through our fingers and we're destroying habitat at such a rate that we truly cannot catch up with it in terms of taking the, the time to get the data that we need to figure out what kind of endangered species are even in those areas. And what causes deforestation? All right, well, we want the land. What do we want the land for? Well, resources, logs, right? We want to get wood or we want grass for our cows or we want corn right? Small-scale agriculture so that we can feed our families. Or large graze agriculture, things like soy, right? Rice, etc. So a lot of this is, all of this actually, is human activity. So we are the cause of tropical deforestation. And the destruction of the rainforest has actually been one of the major motivators for all of the movements that have helped try to get environmental change and green policy together because the destruction of the rainforest, it, you can really see it from the, from the airplanes and it, it really is very stark and it's something that we truly do need to address on a global scale because if we as a planet don't do something to tackle habitat loss and species loss, rainforest bi biodiversity is going to look a little bit more like this. So I had to leave you guys on such dark humor. I, I promise it'll be a little bit more upbeat for our next lecture. Thank you very much for listening to me. Happy studying and aloha.